Jemez Cassio is a research fellow at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California. Our conversation covers a wide array of subjects, including energy production, climate change, and design strategies. However, I'd say the most important thing I learned is his belief that the smartphone is the AK-47 of the 21st century. What role is social media and the internet having on access to information and what that means in terms of human development? It's actually kind of interesting to think about the role that social media and the internet plays because it's all about constructing narratives. See, so one of the, the big power that the internet has had, especially over the past few years, is its ability to disrupt the conventional narrative. So wh whatever mainstream governments have to say, mainstream media have to say, in the pre-internet era, it was possible for uh, these organizations to essentially control the narrative, to mm -hmm. control how you know, the perspectives that people had on these different institutions, because there were so there were so few sources of information, and people could go out and investigate on their own, but but in turn they had very few ways to distribute what they discovered. Absolutely, the internet by democratizing communication has made it possible for alternative narratives to come up and in some cases displace the conventional narratives. And this isn't just around politics, but it's around things as, you know, as vast as how we understand the, uh, the role of the media mm -hmm. and to as narrow as how we understand the com the, what goes into our food. Mm -hmm. and you can take an iPhone app that will let you scan a barcode and immediately pull up data from a variety of different uh, progressive th um, you know, third-party sources to tell you about what, what's the, the health impact of this food, what are, what's the human rights impact of the organization yeah. making this food. And so it's a, re it's a remarkable capacity to, to tell our own story. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is actually probably the primary way that the internet and social media are enabling the creation of a a new way of life. Because finally the people who have thought about this, who are telling these stories about the new way of life, can get that story get that out. information out there. Um, it was interesting you brought up about kind of changing the narrative or the official narrative. Do you think that it has made it more difficult for governments or institutions to propagandize information? And could, the, could a lot of PIPA and SOPA and these various things that we're seeing trying to be passed as anti-piracy legislation be kind of a reaction to their uh, lack of control of information on the internet? Well, that's certainly part of, part of it, that, the, that these kinds of um, global and local uh, regulations around intellectual property certainly have the, the um, perhaps unintended, perhaps not, mm -hmm. side effect of putting more control over expression. As we saw with SOPA and PIPA, that isn't always successful, although the ACTA anti-counterfeiting mm -hmm. agreement is global, that actually is moving forward. But it's an interesting question that you ask because it's a, on the one hand, there are all of these reactionary movements to try to clamp down on information, clamp down on the internet. And at the same time, there's growing sophistication on the part of official institutions, uh, mainstream institutions, in creating their narratives, in mm -hmm. essentially propagandizing, as you say, in telling these stories the way they want to tell it, in a, in a language that the generations that are accustomed to social media, that are, that are enmeshed, yeah. enmeshed in social media, are very comfortable with. So it's a, it's a parallel tracks, you know, trying to control the, the democratized communication while becoming much more sophisticated, much more powerful at using these tools of democratized communication mm -hmm. to um, pollute the narrative. That's what works. Do you think that uh, groups like Anonymous, or you know, uh, I'm sure there will be splinter groups of that, or Lulzac. exact things like that, do you think that we will see them play a larger role as we proceed into the future in almost trying to police the police in a sense? I'm sure they'd like to. That was part of the logic behind Lulzac. Yeah. You know, the um, the group that really went out went after some of the um, government and corporate data sources. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that actually got hit pretty hard. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that you see these hacker groups do, you know, Anonymous and the various fellow travelers, amounts to um, vandalism. Mm -hmm. um, so they may celebrate going and putting the, the Anonymous you know, logo on the CIA website. Yeah. Well, that's about the, the same as painting your logo on the, the sign outside the of a building, yeah. and about as meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so as long as they are distracted by this kind of petty vandalism, mm -hmm. they're not going to really be uh, important political actors. If they can in turn recognize that there is a larger uh, a larger issue at stake, or there are larger issues at stake, that there are more important things they could be doing with those skills, then we might see them taking on that kind of watching the watchman yeah. role. It's going to be difficult because the degree to which they try to do things like that is the degree to which the opposition to them from you know, the FBI and, and parallel, parallel forces around the world will be hitting down, mm -hmm. coming down hard. Uh, because that is that's threatening vandalism isn't. Mm -hmm. The mobile phone is in many respects the AK-47 of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. If you think about revolutionary movements of the 20th century, very often the iconic, the iconic uh, object mm -hmm. is the AK-47. Yeah. You know, it's on. Uh, it was on a number of flags mm -hmm. because it was the symbol of re revolution in the people's hands. I think the mobile phone fulfills a similar role today in being a, an object, a technological object that has revolutionary potential, but it's a brittle weapon mm -hmm. because the AK-47, the only thing you need to keep it going is a supply of bullets and bullets aren't hard to make or find. Yeah. What you need for the mobile phone is you need the cellular towers and the mobile network provider and the routers and, and wires and such, and this is a brittle technology that can be shut down. Mm -hmm. As we saw in San Francisco a few months ago where the um, BART tried to shut down mobile phones yeah. to, to stop protests. What we saw in Iran a couple of years ago, same kind of thing. Now, what we saw in both those, both those cases, though, is that they couldn't keep that restriction going for very long. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the power that the internet and mobile technologies have as a revolutionary tool is direct, uh, directly related to how deeply enmeshed they are in the mainstream socio-economic structure, mm -hmm. which is kind of a paradox, because the only way these can, be, these can serve as truly revolutionary tools is if they are truly mainstream tools as well. Absolutely. The value that mobile phones and other kinds of mobile networked devices, the value that they have as, as revolutionary tools is their capacity to display, to show things, yeah. you know, the transparency that they engender. These are devices that are intrinsically designed to uh, show everyone what's happening. Yeah. And as we're moving into an era where you can have an always-on network connection, you could stream the video from your phone. We move away from the scenario where you take, you video capture something and then your phone gets taken away, yeah. or the camera gets taken away. The remarkable thing, or the really valuable thing about these kinds of, of mobile network technologies is they let you get the video out there before anyone can do anything about it. Yeah. The value that these kinds of technologies have as a tool for enabling change mm -hmm. really depends upon how dependent mainstream institutions um, become yeah. on them. When you shut down the, the mobile phone networks in BART in San Francisco a few yeah. months ago, that didn't just harm the, you know, make it hard for the protesters to organize. It hurt everybody trying to use their phones Absolutely. on the network, including people who tried, who tried to make emergency calls. Yeah. When they shut down the, the internet in Iran a couple of years ago, it didn't just hurt the protesters, it hurt everybody trying to do business. This is the, in many respects, this is the power that this otherwise brutal technology has, yeah. is that you know, being, you know, getting that, depend that interdependency. Um, so yes, you will almost certainly see um, further efforts on the part of institutional authorities to, uh, to shut things down yeah. as a way of stopping stopping the pro proliferation of bad ideas. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but you'll also see that becoming increasingly untenable mm -hmm. as a response. And so it'll be something where they shut it down and then have to turn it back on faster than they'd like. Now, if you get to a case, a situation where you can develop an alternate uh, communication network, mm -hmm. you know, so using it, instead of using the, um, the cell towers, using peer-to-peer uh, communications, yeah. then shutting down the network doesn't help because you still can keep talking. There aren't many people doing a lot of work on the peer-to-peer -peer stuff except in emergency response world. It's not about the technology, it's not about the gadgets and how many gigabytes or megahertz or whatever. Yeah. It's really about how do they change our perception of each other? 
how do, how do these technologies change our sense of how we interact with each other, mm -hmm. what, our authorities, what our authority is over another? It empowers us or degrades us in the, in the ways of that how other people use those technologies. And so it's a very human situation that we often just sort of ascribe to being technical. Yeah, in a number of my talks, I, I often say that technology is a cultural artifact. Mm. Um, and we have to stop thinking about technology as being something outside of humans. It's yeah. a, something that humans make and ha as, has embedded in it human cultural and political norms. How close are we, really, to peak oil? And what kind of effect is that going to have on society? And what are our options going to be after that? And w when we really come to terms with the fact that we can't continue to, to do this. We're going to stop using oil before we run out of oil. That's interesting. You know, the, Einstein had a great line that you know, around nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. said, the Stone Age didn't didn't end because we ran out of stones. You know, the Oil Age isn't going to end because we run out of oil. We're going to shift away from it be long before we're out of oil, and we're going to shift away from it because of um, the political nightmare around oil, the ecological nightmare around oil. Probably have a half step, half measure, I mean, starting to adopt more natural gas use, mm -hmm. but even that will go away. How long that will take is contingent upon how long it takes for, for the first really big climate disaster to hit, something that makes you know, Katrina look like a joke. Mm -hmm. And that will happen. It's just a question of how soon does that happen, because that's the kind of thing that will cause a paradigm shift and how people think about this, about this situation. And that's, for me, I think the biggest tragedy around climate is that the only way that we're going to get people to change their minds is to have a horrible disaster happen. And I don't want that to be the trigger. Of course. It looks more and more like that's going, going to be the trigger because we have all of these forces pushing us away from trying to deal with this. Mm -hmm. In terms of peak oil, peak oil I don't think is gonna be an issue. It's really about, well, peak carbon. Okay. You know, at, at what point are we going to realize that we have to change things because we, we can't afford to put more carbon into the atmosphere? What are some of your thoughts on urban design? The goal of, of building a sustainable city really needs to be focused on building an adaptable city. Mm. So whether your buildings or your infrastructure, it, should, it isn't just trying to build for greater density, although that's part of it. It yeah. isn't just trying to build for recovery of water and things like that, although that's part of it. It's trying to build in a way that when you develop new patterns of behavior or new technologies, those can be integrated fairly easily. There are people who like to talk about the idea of a sustainable city having essentially no roads, and it's all walking paths, bike paths, and, and public transit. And that's great, except if we, as the trajectory of vehicle technology seems to be moving, as we start to develop more uh, self-driving cars, it turns out that, that, the, that the math is such that self-driving cars, especially if they're shared, mm -hmm. are actually a lot more sustainable, a lot more efficient mm -hmm. in terms of energy, space, et cetera, than trains and buses. Okay. So a maximally efficient city would actually be one that is accessible to self-driving cars. Interesting. But if you're building your city around the notion of bike paths and, and metro trains, mm -hmm. there's no place for a self-driving vehicle mm -hmm. in there. So again, how can you build your, design your city, design your space in a way that allows for maximum flexibility? And that's kind of a hard thing to do because you, you know, by its very nature, you can't predict what's to come. Yeah. You can make scenarios, you can make estimates, you're going to be making trade-offs. Well, we want to go this way, and this is good for now, but it might restrict us down the road. How can we build? How can we integrate that? You know, that transportation design. How can we integrate that um, communication network design yeah. in a way that won't be overly difficult to change? When I think about cities, when I think about societies, I actually have been steering away from using the word sustainable okay. lately, and really thinking more in terms of resilient. Okay. And a lot of people who are sustainability advocates disagree with me on this, but when I think sustainability, sustainable, that seems to me to be a static 
ah. condition. Mm. So you reached a point of sustainability and you want to do whatever you can to stay sustainable. Yeah. Um, but conditions change. Yeah. And so a, a situation where that was once sustainable may no longer be if other things in your environment shift. Yeah. A resilient society, a resilient city is one that is intrinsically designed to adapt to change. Yeah. You know, the resilience of something is its ability to withstand unexpected shocks, to recover quickly, and to con continue on from there. And that actually in plays out in some really interesting ways about how that, you know, what does it mean to have a resilient economy versus an efficient economy? Because resilience and, and efficiency, resiliency and efficiency tend to be at loggerheads. Mm -hmm. You make things as efficient as possible, and you're cutting off as many, you're cutting off alternatives. And if something bad happens, things get really screwed up. You make things as resilient as possible, and you're trying to ma maximize the number of alternatives, and that means a lot of there's a lot of wasted potential yeah. because you're not using all of those alternatives simultaneously. And we've been building our economy, building our society around maximizing efficiency. Mm -hmm. And when it works, it works really well. People make a lot of money. People yeah. live really well. And when it breaks, it breaks hard. Yeah. yeah I think you can you, uh, you can make a good case that the economic crisis that that really hit in 2008, had been building for a while, and hit in 2008, and um, continued to this day, is really one of having a, building our, our economy around efficiency to a degree that was pathological. Hmm. You know, trying to maximize profit, trying to maximize efficiency, and when it broke, it really broke hard. And so when we think about sustainability of cities, again, I want to think, well, what, how can we build a city not to be sustainable so much as resilient? And you get sustainability as a side effect of resilience. Yeah. Um, you get sustainability as when you are, yeah, as something that's woven into this notion of building a city that can withstand the unexpected. Yeah. And part of being able to withstand the unexpected is to minimize your inputs, minimize your dependence upon energy, et cetera. Where do you think the future of energy is going? There are ultimately three sources of energy. Mm -hmm. There's the sun, and that gives us solar power, it drives the wind, it drives currents. You know, when we talk about wind power, we talk about hydrokinetic power, it's all solar power, just yeah. in different ways. Um, and that is, that's a good one. I mean, we have you know, a, a kilowatt per square meter, I think is the, the, amount of, the average amount of sunlight hitting the Earth, so that's just a huge amount that yeah. we can take advantage of. And we're going to. That will, be, that will end up being one of the primary ways that we get of generating power, you know, solar paint, things like that, making yeah. everything photovoltaic. Whatever your object is, your clothes, the hat, the bag, the shoes, the road, everything generates a little bit of power. Yeah. You, don't need it to, you don't need to run everything off of your shirt, but if your shirt contributes to the amount of power that you're using, that's great. Absolutely. It's sort of a corollary to that is you need to de develop really, really good uh, energy storage technology. Okay. Okay, so that's you know, solar, the solar family. Yeah. There's nuclear. Um, which isn't dependent upon the sun, mm -hmm. uh, dependent upon you know essentially raw elements, yeah. you know rocks in the earth or the very you know, helium or whatever, and that is more complex to use, but has a number of advantages over solar, in, you know, including um, stability. Mm -hmm. you, once you start your your reactor going, it's going until there's an earthquake and a flood and all that yeah. stuff. Um, it's going until you shut it down or it gets shut down. Yeah. And so it's at night, it's during the day, it doesn't matter. And that's, that's really nice for some, some purposes. It's not very mobile, mm -hmm. it's not very flexible. So I think I if you're thinking again in terms of resilience and what a resilient society would look like, it, that's something that is a, a backup okay. energy source. Um, fusion if and when we get fu you know, nucle good nuclear fusion technology that has a number of advantages over the, the fission technology that we have right now, um, but a number of big difficulties. It's, again, it's something that has to be really big and centralized. Yeah. The third source of energy is the really freaky one. Okay. That is, it's the vacuum yeah. of space. It turns out that there are all of these particles that are forming and disappearing and forming and disappearing. And there are ways of taking advantage of that energy that's forming and disappearing. Um, there's something called the Casimir effect, mm -hmm. that when you get two particles or two, two plates really, really close together, the 
vacuum energy actually starts to push them. Hmm. It's a very, very minute amount of energy. Yeah. But it's literally infinite. Wow. And if you could figure out a way to tap that, and there's no guarantee that you even could. Yeah. I mean, this is really out, in the, out there in the world of speculation. Yeah. But if you could figure out a way of tap, to tap that, then your energy problems are solved forever. forever. Yeah. Because you're actually drawing it out of the fabric of the universe. What, where do you think the future of education lies in both the, the first and third world in terms of technology and just the basic approach to how we tackle education? Mm. That's a huge mess. Education is a mess. Because the desire to integrate technological solutions is butting up against the pace at which technological solutions evolve. Mm -hmm. So we think we have a good idea and then suddenly that technology is not is obsolete yeah. or has been replaced by something else we have to use in a slightly different way. So the technological aspect of whether you're talking about first world or third world education, you know, developing or hyper-developed world education, is is problematic. Um, lots of people now talk about, oh, let's use tablets. Give yeah. everybody an iPad. Well, that's great, and you know that that iPad that you're that you're giving everybody is going to be obsolete really soon. Obsolete in a way that actually new applications when they come out won't run on it anymore. I mean, yeah. in terms of pedagogy, you know, the the approach, um, you know, the. You know, the standard argument is that we have a pedagogy that's based on the 19th century model of most of having to have the kids go home to work on the farm. That's been sort of shoehorned into getting people ready to be part of an industrial economy. And we need, you know, and that's, that's broken. I, I, that, I think that, that's right. How you construct an educational, a pedagogy around a 21st century model around information age, post-information age model is really, hasn't been solved. That mm -hmm. problem hasn't been solved. My suspicion is it will be something around um, emphasizing skills of analysis over memorization. Mm -hmm. If your hardware is remembering things for you, I don't need to memor I don't need to, to know my multiplication tables if I have a calculator built into everything. Yeah. I don't need to remember all the presidents if I can look it up on you know. In encyclopedia. Exactly. At first, that sounds like what do you mean you don't need to know these things? Well, what I need to know is why that matters, yeah. how to apply this information. And that's something that we don't do a very good job of teaching people to do. How, you know, figure out how to apply, how to use, how to decide whether, you know, how to be able to analyze whether this information resource is actually useful. You know, I'd say, oh, I'm getting the information about the presidents from Wikipedia. Well, how do I know that that's gonna be reliable? How do I compare the information? Mm -hmm. How do I make use of the resources? You know, when you look on Wikipedia, you use the entry simply as a jumping off point to find the, the source material, yeah. as an example. Teaching students to think critically, to think analytically, to be able to compare, to be able to think in terms of, of long-term if-then scenarios. That strikes me as a likely path forward for education. Um, but nobody's really constructed a good pedagogy that I've seen yeah. yet around that. I mean, there are definitely organizations that are working on it. Yeah. Um, another aspect of that paradigm, I think, is going to be shifting the concept of education from being something that you do when you're a kid mm -hmm. to something that you're doing all the time. Yeah. And you focus on it when you're a kid, but you still do it as you get older. You, it still is part of your experience, yeah. your life experience, especially if we're talking about a situation where people are living for much longer Absolutely. and have a, have a healthy, youthful life for much longer. It, it changes, it changes the, the pattern of our, you know, the arc of our life. If we move away from having, you know, being a kid and then working and then retiring and dying. Yeah. So when you have a, if your life trajectory is now something where you know, you're, you're born, you have a, you're a kid, and then you're working, you're working, you're working, you're working, you're working, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem very appealing. Yeah. Um, a parallel question that I sometimes ask people when the talk I'm giving involves things around biology, human life, and all that yeah. is, if you knew you're going to live to be 200, which there are a lot of biologists who are saying that this is entirely plausible, um, if not longer than that. If you knew you're going to be live to be 200 and it's gonna be a healthy life for almost all of that. Can you imagine marrying somebody at 25 and, and being married to that person for the next 175 years? Mm. 
Yeah, and it, it's really great to ask yeah. you know, people in an audience where it's mostly older people and say, you know, can you imagine being married to the person that you're married to now for the next 100, 150 years? Yeah. And the, the people pale in <laughs> just thinking about, oh, God. Yeah. You know, you know, I love my wife dearly. I can't imagine being married to her for the next 150 years. Yeah. And so what that suggests is that we're, we'll be migrating towards a, a model of living that is almost, you have different stages in your life. You know, I've completed this stage, and I'm going to educate myself on something else. Maybe have move into a different community, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, this is we're gonna, the the changes that are happening around access to information and around biology are intertwining in really interesting ways that are going to have really big uh, lead to really big effects, really big disruptions to how we live our lives. Yeah. Know, what it means to be an adult human being in our civilization. And that's not just in the hyper-developed world. It's not just in the West. Because the, these kinds of advances that lead to you know, longer lifespans, more access to information, those are actually um, spreading pretty quickly. And so it won't be a situation where everybody gets the same treatment at the same time, yeah. but, it's neither, but neither is going to be a situation where some parts of the world have access and no, don't let anyone else have access to it because information spreads quickly, including information about these kinds of technologies. Absolutely. And biotech doesn't require a big industrial base. If building out your big 20th century industrialized economy required you have a big industrial base, yeah. and all of the energy and infrastructure and roads, et cetera, biotech just requires you to have a good university, yeah. have interesting, you know, interested you know, students who may have gone to university someplace else, yeah. but are willing to do something. It doesn't require a big industrial base to do the kinds of things that are have really big disruptions on how we live our lives over the next 50 years. Do you believe that everything will be all right? I'm a short-term pessimist and long-term optimist. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the dilemma of being a futurist is to be constantly thinking about the implications of present-day activities and thinking in terms of different scenarios and, and looking historically about how we've dealt with past, past issues. Yeah. And so it's really easy to say, OK, well, this is a very clear right path, very clear path forward that, that works for everybody, and we're probably not going to take it. Yeah. And so it's, you get caught up in that kind of thinking. And it's very difficult to look over the next 10 to 25 years and not see a really hard time for a lot of people on this planet. That said, if we make it through that 10 to 25 year interregnum, um, if we make it through the, the period of the big challenge, there are so many drivers of positive change, things that can make everyone's lives better. And, whether, and we're talking technologically, we're talking demographically, we're talking um, in terms of how we understand human behavior and understand the mind, um, how we deal with food, how we deal with water. All of these things that are really big challenges or dilemmas or problems now, there are paths ahead that make them much easier that make them much more reliable, much more widely available. In some respects, if you look, if you look ahead 75, you know, 50, 75, 100 years, in some respects, it's almost easier to construct a positive scenario than a negative one, as long as we make it through this first period. Yeah. And so that is the big challenge that we face. How can we deal with the really big, complex problems when the tools that we have available to us, the, the institutional, the cultural tools that we have available to us are broken? Yeah or are brittle. And that then becomes a, a task that faces us as responsible citizens of human civilization to recognize the problems that we face and to understand that the challenges, you know, the results of these challenges, if they're not dealt with, could be devastating for people who may not be, it may not be devastating for us. Yeah. We may get through this okay and other people suffer. And that that's not acceptable. And so recognizing that we have a responsibility to ourselves and to others, that if we can make that change, if we can adopt that mindset, then we are far more likely to make it through this dark period. Uh, I mentioned at the outset that it seems like humanity is acting like teenagers. Yeah. There's something that a bit of neuroscience that came up recently that a lot of people have, aren't really aware of is that it turns out that 
teenage brains really are different from adult brains mm -hmm. in terms of um, the connections that have been made, the ability to think ahead. Moreover, that ability, that adult brain care, um, condition really doesn't start to, to settle in until around 25 or 26. Okay. So people are actually cognitively teenagers into their early 20s. Yeah. But we don't treat them culturally as if they're teenagers anymore. And so there's this period, this young adult period, where people are still acting like teenagers, but have all of the rights and responsibilities of adults. Yeah. I think maybe that's actually what we're in. We're not teenage, our, our civilization isn't teenagers in the sense of being 14 years old, yeah. figuratively, but in the sense of being 23 years old, huh. figuratively. We know that there are responsibilities that, that we have, there are, there are things that we should be doing, but it's, that's not fun. You know, let's, let's screw around, let's, yeah. take, let's deal with it right now. And my hope is that we get out of that period sooner rather than later. Yeah. If the smartphone is the AK-47 of the 21st century, then we are a peacefully armed populace, and our ammunition is information. It's my belief that those who would limit access to information are limiting human progress, and it's up to each of us to fight against censorship in all of its forms.